for calling my sister-in-law and brother <laughs> after my sister-in-law insulted both me and my wife. My wife, 34 female, and I, 47 male, are staying with my parents, grandma, older brother, brother-in-law, their kids, younger brother, sister-in-law, and their kids at a beach house we rented for two weeks. The more the merrier. I should preface this by saying that frankly, I don't get along with my younger brother, Todd, and I don't like my sister-in-law, Anne. That being said, I am civil with them, and while I don't see them often, I do love my niece and nephews. Yesterday, my wife, Alice, and and I were babysitting all of our nieces and nephews while my grandma napped and everyone else went to see a movie. Now, once we got there, Alice and I had baked cookies for everyone to eat. We baked them later in the evening and Anne, who works as a personal trainer, told her kids they couldn't have any. The kids were upset, of course, especially because their cousins were allowed cookies, but Anne was insistent that they weren't allowed any at the time. She and Todd are generally quite strict with the kids' diets. None of them have any food allergies. And to my recollection, they have only been allowed a popsicle once this past week. I mean, they are her kids and if that's her choice, then that's her choice. While everyone was out, one of the kids asked Alice if they could have cookies. Not my problem. And so we gave them all some cookies to enjoy. I mean, it's a small thing, but she did explicitly say that she doesn't want to give her kids cookies. I honestly think that kids are probably going to find a way to eat sweets anyway, <laughs> but I digress. When everyone came home, Anne asked the kids what they did and one of them mentioned that we gave them cookies. You little rat! Shush! She then told them to play on the beach or they were watched by my older brother and brother-in-law and were joined by their cousins. Anne then proceeded to get very mad. She started off by saying that we shouldn't have given them cookies because she hadn't said they could have them. Alice started to apologize and say we just wanted them to enjoy their vacation, but Anne interrupted her and told her she didn't trust a fat ass with her kids' health. That phony bitch! Yeah, you lost me there, Anne. You don't have a right to fat shame other people for what they eat. Now, I was absolutely livid and I told her to shut the F up. The argument spiraled from there and at one point, Anne said she should never have trusted two psychos with her kids. Alice and I met in a therapy group 11 years ago. Oh, wow, so she's shaming mental health too. After we were discharged from the hospital for mental health concerns. Though I'd like to emphasize we weren't there for anything that would even imply that we'd put anyone else in danger. It doesn't matter, babe, that's your business. Certainly not something that people are allowed to weaponize against you. I then told her that it was rich for two hours <laughs> to think they could ever raise a morally healthy kid. Anne was originally Todd's best friend's wife. Whoa. But the two had an affair during which their oldest child was conceived. Then Anne and her husband had what sounds like a rather messy divorce. She then started crying and left. Our family is a bit divided over this. I realize I was very harsh, but so was she. And I do not think it was her place to dish out what she couldn't take. So am I the a-hole. You are right about that, but I feel like all of this didn't even need Need to take place if you didn't give the kids cookies. This would not have happened. However, she does not have a right to say what she said. Honestly, everyone sucks here. You're all out. <laughs> everyone sucks. Correct. You knew the kids couldn't have cookies, so you deliberately stepped all over their boundaries. and attacked you personally, which is out of bounds. You responded with your own immature insults. But let's face it, this started with you not respecting their boundary as parents. She did express a boundary. She was very clear about what she expected. However, she sounds like kind of a bitch. So, <laughs> this. And when I spent time with people with different belief or parenting styles, I respected them. And it was good for my kid too, to know to respect kids and other parents' cultures or boundaries. If I made cookies, I would have told my kid, one, to wait for dessert and everybody to enjoy them, or two, to get one, but to go eat it in private. You really do have to respect parents' wishes. It's not your kid. I personally think that a kid will find a way to have sweets regardless of what the parent says, especially if it's something that they're not allowed to have. But that doesn't stop it from being exactly what it is. You overstepped a boundary, a very clear boundary. Here's an interesting take. You sure as hell shouldn't always respect other people's parenting styles. Restricting kids' food intake so severely leads to disordered eating. That's a good point. Like if we're talking about, are we fat shaming the kids? It kind of sounds like sh she's someone who likes to fat shame people for what they eat. In which case, you know, it could also go the other way. If she's an almond mom, which is kind of what she sounds like, then she could be setting her kids up to have eating disorders. But again, and it's also not your business. Not your kid, not your problem. Unless, of course, that kid is in danger. <laughs> Everyone sucks. You all suck. You're all a-holes. I'm considering divorcing my wife because she can't get over her mom dying. My 36 male wife's 33 female mother passed away five years ago from lung cancer. It was not a peaceful or easy death. Our lives understandably went on pause after the diagnosis and we both spent a lot of time off work helping care for her mother. My wife had a pretty typical showing of grief at the time, cycling through different stages. 
Same with our three kids. After she passed, however, my wife got really bad. I totally understand this. I can't say I know exactly what she went through because I haven't had a parent die, but I understand how devastated she was. For months after, she could barely function. I gently took over pretty much all the responsibilities in the household and with the kids. She had been attending grief counseling since the diagnosis and continued after her death. None of this is the problem. I endeavored to be as supportive as possible. She cried on my shoulder every night for months, and I just thought that this was the worst of for better or worse. The problem is that after five years, she does not seem any better or more functional. She stopped grief counseling about four years ago and refused to go again it would not help her and that nothing could. About a month before any major holiday, she will have a major downturn. In bed half the day, crying all day, does not want to interact with the family, does not have the energy to do anything around the house. This will go on every single day until about a week after the holiday ends. Every holiday is intense grief just as much as it was five years ago. October, November, December, and January, her mom's birthday month. Every year are particularly bad. I am essentially without my wife and am a single parent to my three kids. Altogether, she's completely incapacitated by grief for about six months months out of the year and has been the past five years. When I say incapacitated, I mean incapacitated. When she's in the depths of her grief, she is completely incapable of intimacy with me or the kids. There's no cuddling, spending time with us, going on family outings. I've stopped asking her if she wants to talk about it because she can't get any words out between sobs if she tries. What hurts the most is that the kids have stopped asking or being concerned. If they see their mom in bed when they get home, they just go about their day and might casually mention, oh, mom is sad today if their siblings ask or i ask where she is they don't really seek affection with her anymore because they rarely get anything more than tears i've discussed this with therapists my parents friends etc and i know all the rebuttals people have for this so let me repeat them. She is unwilling to go back to therapy for grief counseling or to see a doctor for depression. Yes, I know she's severely depressed. I can't force her to go to the doctor. I've tried so much. Yes, it really is just as intense as it was five years ago. No, I will never tell her to get over it or blow her off. On my worst days, I just give her space and leave her be. Most days, I try to offer her some comfort. If you want to judge me for leaving her alone, whatever. But know that I feel like I essentially have caretaker fatigue at this point. No, she does not have a history of depression, but she does have ADHD. Don't know if that's relevant. I feel like my wife died when her mom died. I would do anything to get her back, even a small piece of her, but she doesn't seem to be willing or able to move on past her mom's death. I feel awful for considering a divorce, but I don't know what else to do. I carried my own poop in my bag for nearly 10 miles. What an interesting time to take a sip of a freshly opened LaCroix. When I, 23 female, was 18, I had a summer job working as a cashier at a large supermarket. I spent most of my nights at my boyfriend's parents' home in a smaller town about a 20-minute drive away. And one morning, he wanted to wake and bake, and he didn't have work until the evening. And as I didn't have work until just after midday, I thought, fuck it, I'm going to do what Chris did and take a hit in the <laughs> studio. <laughs> I was trying to be so slick, not get you demonetized. I'm like doing downward dog under the table, just trying to get a puff. So we hit the bong and then went to the kitchen to have a full English breakfast. As I was this finishing- This is like my dream morning routine. This sounds great. <laughs> a full English breakfast, by the way, those get shit on way too much. Those beans, phenomenal. She says that. As I was finishing off my baked beans, I saw the time and realized I had just over 10 minutes to get the bus home and in time for work. So I ran to get my things and quickly used the bathroom. Bathroom. Turns out I needed the biggest shit of my life, which was refusing to flush down his tiny ass toilet. I was running out of time till my bus and I had to think fast. My first thought was to wrap it in a toilet roll, which was a huge fail as it just absorbed the water and stuck to the poo. Yes, I had to pick it oh up God. with my hands. <laughs> I was planning to wrap it up and put it in the bin next to the toilet. Did she just not want to, like, have her boyfriend see her shit? Yeah, but I immediately realized how disgusting that would have been. Next, I thought I should throw it out the window. <laughs> but what if it lands in the gutter? His bedroom is in the attic. Or even if it didn't, someone in his family would just go out there and just find a human poo on the garden floor. <laughs> I was really starting to panic at this point, as I was so close to missing the bus, which would have meant being late for work. I was high as fuck, so I was freaking out oh, even more than I element. usually would. Oh my god. And I couldn't think of any way out of the situation. When I checked my phone, I had no time left, so I grabbed a t-shirt out of my bag, one of my favorites, RIP, wrapped it around the giant shit and with wet toilet paper stuck to it, and ran downstairs to find my boyfriend waiting to say goodbye. He was probably wondering what was taking me so long. There was no way 
way I'd be giving him a hug and a kiss with a whole poop in my bag. So I ran out the door shouting how I was going to miss my bus and reached the bus stop, which was fortunately right outside his house. Now, it was a sunny, hot day in July. I had a fat shit in my bag <laughs> and I was stood at the bus stop baked as a cake, freaking out about how everyone on the bus is going to think I smell of shit. Yeah. And how it's just going to cook in my bag <laughs> because it was already so hot and the little bus will be like an oven. But also a t-shirt isn't like a plastic bag. It's just going to get wet and shit covered and stain everything in your bag. Yeah, you, you should have just asked for a plunger. You should have just said, babe, take care of it. There was no way to discard my poop while I waited for the bus and I barely had a minute till it arrived so I couldn't just chuck a t-shirt full of poop outside my boyfriend's parents' home. And even if I did, my boyfriend would have known it was my t-shirt. And God forbid, pick it up thinking I dropped it by accident. Dot, dot, dot. So I get on the hot, sweaty bus. Hi, paranoid and certain everyone could smell the shit in my bag. And now I'm wondering how I'm going to talk to my mom when I get home when I'm super blazed and smell like shit. I get home and run straight upstairs and shout down that I'm going to be late for work. I jump in the shower, put on my uniform, and I'm immediately out the door, barely speaking to my mom. The supermarket I work at is about a 30-minute uphill walk from my house. I'm still high. <laughs> it's really hot outside. And as I'm 10 minutes into the walk, I realize I still have a fucking shit in my handbag. <laughs> my own fucking shit in my fucking handbag. I was so determined to avoid my mom and get to work. My high ass didn't even think to take it out and dispose of it in my mom's toilet. And now I'm nearly at Tesco and I still have poop in my bag. Unfortunately, the closest bin was right outside my work. So I put my whole bag in the bin and go to the staff room like nothing happened. I then spent the rest of the day scanning customers groceries, traumatized about what I'd been up to. And I've had to live with this information all my life and have been too embarrassed to tell anyone. I guess I could have just told my boyfriend I couldn't fly. <laughs> And didn't I have guess. To, <laughs> I guess. I didn't have time to wait for it, but we were still fresh in our relationship, and I couldn't stand the thought of him getting rid of my giant shit while I'm not even there. That seems <sighs> like best case scenario. Feels good to get that off my chest. Sorry for the long read. I mean, this isn't great of me to say. In that scenario, I would use the litter card. I am reeling and very heartbroken. Here's the deal. When I was 20 years old, I'm 27 now. I met my best friend at a uni seminar. When we first met, he was interested in me romantically, but I didn't reciprocate his feelings, so we managed to form a beautiful platonic friendship. A few years down the track, COVID hit, and we started to spend a lot of time together. I would go to his house several times a week. We'd just hang out, watch TV together, talk and cook. I realized pretty quickly that I had fallen in love with him, but I was also desperately scared. What if he didn't feel the same now, years later? What if he did, but it didn't work out and then we lost our friendship? I remember one specific moment during this period when I left his flat and felt so intensely in love with him. I stopped at the stairs and wanted to go back and knock on his door so badly to tell him how I felt. But because I was so scared, I didn't. And I have been circling back to this moment for the past two and a half years because I will never forgive myself for not going back inside. Oh no. Just a couple of weeks after this moment, he met a wonderful woman online. There we go. There it is. I was super jealous, but thought I wasn't entitled to interfere since I hadn't had the guts to tell him how I felt. Also, a little part of me hoped, and maybe assumed, that it wouldn't lead to anything. They have been together for two years now, and just moved in together. As far as I can tell, their relationship is super healthy and they are both very happy. Of course, I am happy that he is so happy, but I have also been in such deep despair for the past two and a half years that I feel like I can't take it anymore. To make matters worse, I recently found out from a mutual friend that he did have strong feelings for me when I was too scared to knock on his door. That's like a sliding doors moment. Yeah. I am so angry with myself and can't forgive myself for letting him go. I told myself that I could move past this, but I can't. I've been in a relationship myself for nine months now, but my feelings just don't match what I feel for my friend and I constantly compare them. I know this is deeply unfair to my boyfriend and I know I should probably end that relationship because he definitely deserves a person who can give him the love he deserves. I feel like the worst person in the world and I can't shake the feeling I have fucked up my life. I can never say anything to my friend now or meddle with his relationship, 
but it gets harder and harder to put on a mask when I see them together and pretend like I'm okay with it all. I'm not okay. I feel like a big black hole opens up in my chest when I'm with them. So my question is, what do I do with this secret? I feel like the only option is to distance myself from him. Even the thought of being at his possible future wedding makes me want to curl up in a dark corner. But ending our friendship would also break my heart into a million tiny pieces.